I would now like to introduce our um, final international keynote speaker, uh, Professor Gabriel Fischer. Um, uh, Professor Gabriel Fischer has come all the way from Vienna uh, today. She's the medical director of the addiction clinic there since 1994, and since 2000 has been the professor of psychiatry and neurology at the Medical University of Vienna. Um, and again, today, another sort of very important human rights issue that uh, Gabriel is going to speak to us about. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for your nice introduction. And first of all, I want to say thank you to the organizers for having me again at an EPSET meeting. I, I think it's my third now, and I, it's always very enjoyable being here, networking with uh, a lot of young people, having interesting experiences. Uh, it's just delightful, and I want to say thank you for, for having me here. I think um, I was asked to, to give a speech on, on, on human rights aspects in, in relation to substance use disorder, and I think there couldn't be any other day as perfect as today after your positive voting to equality of rights. So um, I think it's the, the, the topic fits quite well to the, to the day today. Uh, I, I do have one question. As Craig pointed out, I have been the medical director of the Addiction Research and Treatment Clinic at the Medical University in Vienna. However, I do something else over the last two years, and I wonder to whom in the audience is the National Prevention Mechanism uh, known? It's called NPM, very briefly. Could you raise the hands? No, it's not. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to be explaining this to you, what, what, it, what it means, because you're going to be see on one of the slides that um, Australia actually uh, signed and ratified the Convention and the Protocol in relation to the OPCAT and to the CRPD. These are, these are two aspects. The OPCAT stands for the op optional, which is here. Uh, and I, I, I was asked whether they, the slides can be loaded up on, your, on, on the web page so you can go over and, and read um, more carefully if you're interested. OPCAT means it's the optional protocol of the Committee Against Torture, and CRPD means the Convention on Rights for People with Disabilities. And the both mandates are covered by the National Prevention Mechanism. The National Prevention Mechanism means that for, for my small country, Austria in Central Europe, which has about eight million inhabitants, that I chair this, uh, this, uh, this commission, and there are um, 40 members out of different disciplines, from state attorneys, juridical knowledge, nursing knowledge, psychiatrists, and we go uh, unannounced to different institutions. It, it was created the, actually to look into institutions like prison where um, people are withdrawn from their freedom and uh, there could be actually uh, uh, inhuman uh, treatment. But this mandate was extended actually to psychiatric clinics to look into the treatment of involuntary admissions. And one of the aspects where it was e extended was looking into the population of people with substance use disorder, whether their treatment is in line with the human rights treaties. And I'm gonna be covering this in my presentation and, um, and give you some, 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 some background. And hopefully I can introduce the topic to you that you might get more interest in Australia and in New Zealand because um, Actually, both mandates um, are, uh, are, are, uh, are under, under control in, in, in your countries. These are my conflicts of interest, and um, I have been doing uh, quite some research in the addiction field over the last uh, decades, and um, like I want to echo uh, Nick and Sarah's in the last session. Um, I don't know whether Chris Chapler is here. He was uh, um, actually the, uh, in, in charge um, of record, in Racket Bank. He's a company, 
when I started to do my first buprenorphine trial after I, I studied in the US and I returned to Europe, I thought it might be a, a nice idea also trying to introduce buprenorphine to opiate addicts. And we did the first comparison trial with methadone. And in line, in continuation, then um, uh, we started to do the first trials on buprenorphine during pregnancy, which was kind of risky undertaking because no pharmaceutical company actually likes to support research in pregnancy because it's really risky. And the treatments, um, the, the, the trial actually were not sponsored. They were sponsored by public money, but um, he was uh, gentle enough and interested enough to provide the medication um, that we can use it for, for this, um, uh, this special group of patients. How does addiction influence the outcome of pregnancy? So uh, I think it's a... Um, it's, it, it, it goes for, for, for the whole um, uh, population suffering addiction disorders, but we do know that uh, drugs cause a lot of medical problems. In the conference, we heard a lot of uh, 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 treatment in HCV, what I thought is really delightful to learn that everybody in Australia has the right of getting the new DAA treatment for, uh, in, in, in order to try to have the eradication of the virus, which is really great from a human rights standpoint, which is hardly actually possible. Uh, for example, in Europe, there are some countries who are in line, like Portugal, others like the country I am in, they do not um, accept for everybody. We do not, we, so everybody in the audience is clear that we do have a lot of social problems in our group and also our patient group causes a lot of economic problems usually to, due to the indirect costs and if we would actually meet the human rights criteria uh, from early on, it would be not only improving the quality of life in our target population, it would actually save um, uh, the countries a lot of money. Uh, if we talk about substance use disorder and, and pregnancy, um, of course, that's, that's like in, in all the uh, population, it's the interaction with, with environment and biology. And very often, unfortunately, uh, treatment units or, 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 the, or the population is, 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 is raising their hand and saying, how could you get pregnant if you are not stopping your drugs, you know? The point is, we have to be aware, and I think this is very, very important, to also teach our patient that there is a high genetic loading, a high degree of heritability of acquiring psychiatric disorders, and substance use disorder is belonging to the psychiatric spectrum. And uh, you, you see this, um, the, the figure for substance use disorder and heritability. We do have the high overlapping in, in nicotine um, dependence. Why I'm putting nicotine dependence up? Because from my point of view, this, the, the data are strong enough to know that both methadone and buprenorphine in the case of opioid dependence are safe in the administration during pregnancy. I know that neither of the medication is registered for the use of medication nowhere in the world, but I think there are hardly any substances studied that well as disposed during this uh, special period of life. One aspect I highlighted here is also ADHD. We had in the first um, key lecture with Ifra Kamina, he, he was very much relating to the of, uh, also the heritability of depression, but we do have a very high overlap also looking in ADHD and um, substance use disorder. And if you actually start treating the pregnant uh, population, this is a unique goal because they have a very high motivation usually. If we can, we can keep them retained in treatment, also looking in their comorbidities. This was also mentioned during the meeting in Time magazine uh, that there is a um, the, the, the heading of the United States about the painkillers, and there is a lot um, written about fight, fighting a hidden health crisis, like the Tennessee leads the way to the treatment of neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is a new population of patient. It's not the usual American inner city African American substance use disorder population. 
in pregnancy. These are the mean age of 35 years old. They are Caucasian. They are usually working. And then uh, the whole problem appears if they deliver a child. So women are especially on, on, on the high risk, uh, not only in relation, what is one of the targets in the media about the, uh, about the uh, prevalence of neonatal abstinence syndrome, but it's also related to high mortality. And these are just the, the drugs, what's mostly used. And you see on these slides, um, this kind of uh, uh, mean opioid consumption and the amount, this is basically very much US uh, dominated. It's, uh, Half of them in Europe, and it's not uh, even 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 far away in in your um, countries. As I'm coming from Vienna, I think, and if we talk about the human rights approach, one of the aspects is always the accessibility of services. How easy does it get to be accepted in a program? How easy is it to get the right medication and the uh, additional support? And in 1949, just, just for, the, for, the, for the coincidence, or showing some parallelism, it's, I don't know whether Graham Greene and the Third Man is known to you. This is a really famous book in the famous movie, and it's actually dealing about, oh, sorry. It's dealing about the black market on penicillin. You know, the young children died and their mothers were almost trading anything for getting penicillin for their treatment, but there was a shortcut in treatment. So some people, of course, made a lot of money and diluted the medication, and uh, some children, a lot, of, a lot of people actually died. So it's also an epidemic, might also be, from my point of view, very much related to the accessibility of treatment and the availability of medication. If we talk about pregnancy, uh, we do have a lot of um, confounding variable we need to consider, you know, and it's just, and I, 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 I'm pretty much convinced you in your, uh, your continent, you face the same problem. We not only have the genetic loading uh, in the pregnant mothers of, um, of the susceptibility of substance use disorder, very often we, we experience the so-called assortative mating and we, they have also partners with a substance use a problem. And in order to stabilize pe people, it's very important to, to make sure that the, the right is met, that both, both uh, women and male having accessibility and appropriate care, because this is the beginning of being able to, uh, to raise children and pro providing a safe environment. One of the aspects, and I'm pointing out this here, I do know that Australia is really great in this, this aspect, as New Zealand too, in regard to the nicotine prevalence. You are really very, very low. If you go look at the JAMA publication, it's about 13% as compared to European countries where we have 30% of smokers. And smoking is actually one of the major problems we face if you look into the substance use disorder treatment and pregnancy. It's not the issue whether methadone or buprenorphine are, are, are responsible that the child is small of gestational age. It's the nicotine. And we have to, we cannot neglect, because especially in the psychiatric population, the substance use population, we do have major problems in, uh, in, uh, in getting the, um, and stopping the nicotine um, uh, consumption, and we need to have additional help. And just for um, this medication, to my knowledge, the slim cigarettes are not available anymore in Australia or New Zealand. You have the plain packaging. And this is one of the propagandas why women tended to use. And this is probably known to you. That's how nicotine consumption actually started. You know, the emancipation in women actually made them being, being, being able to buy cigarette packages in France. For example, at the same time, women were allowed to vote. They were allowed to possess a package of cigarettes. And there is a new topic. We probably need to look into it in order under the, under the label of, of, of harm reduction. So 
but it's out of the, the first one was Casablanca, this is out of the movie Tourist, and it's focusing on the e-cigarette. I know you had a symposium here on e-cigarettes, so we might also looking into the harm reduction pattern in our population. But coming back to the issue of, um, of, of, of uh, human rights and safety in, in pregnancy, we, we do need to know that in the general population, the psychiatric comorbidity is much higher in women than it's in male. And we, um, and we do know that 50%, 50 percent of the pregnancies in the general population are, are, are unplanned. So we are not actually uh, supposed to be, be prejudiced or stigmatizing our, our pregnant population because of not planning better. And this gives you just a brief uh, view that we are not only talking about substance use disorder, we talk about uh, a lot of comorbidities, you know, they need to be considered in order to, to, to stabilize our substance use uh, uh, depending population when they are pregnant. This is out of the mother's study you might be aware of. The, we did a, a, a standardized screening for comorbidities and you find that 65% had more uh, than one psychiatric disorders, the majority were related to mood disorders, uh, anxiety, and depression. And here comes in one of the UN treaties on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is the Article 1. Persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairment, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. And of course, substance use disorder is a chronic psychiatric, psychiatric relapsing disorder. I do know that very often we even face the problem with our patients, and if we say, well, you have a psychiatric disorder, they say, no, no, we don't have a psychiatric disorder, we are just using drugs. So it's not, we, we, we need to educate basically our target population that they can accept that they are suffering in a chronic relapsing disorder. In relapses, if somebody is using drugs, we should not be surprised that they are also misusing drugs during the course of treatment. And this is the mandate, actually, what enables us um, to, to, to apply to the states and, and remember their written, ratified needs that they need to have uh, an adequate um, uh, participation in the society, which of course includes the, 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 the right to have a, a proper treatment. This gives you one of the examples. We, we, we published a paper, um, I think, what, two years ago. We had a woman on being maintained for a long time on buprenorphine, tried to get pregnant, but she was unsuccessful. In my country, you have, you get paid the inter, um, IVF uh, um, treatment if you can prove that uh, you're young enough and you are unable to conceive by a natural way. This was quite a battle with the insurances to convince that she is a maintained woman, no relapses on buprenorphine, and she has the right for uh, uh, intravitreal fertilization, and finally she succeeded and got healthy twins. On these slides, you find some UN right treaties. They are actually uh, fit to our, um, uh, to my topic of presentation here. I was covering uh, already the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, what applies for our population. Of course, we also need to consider the Convention on Migrant Workers' Right the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention, I, I, I stated this before, against torture, and the Child Rights Convention. There is no hierarchy. We have to decide and apply the different UN treaties to the special case we are involved in. And one, and I'll come later in more detail to, uh, uh, to, to this uh, Bill of Rights, is the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Of course, we do have to consider all these aspects in order to enable 
our substance uh, uh, misusing population, especially during pregnancy, to have a, a full participation um, in life. This is the world. This is the world uh, showing the CRBD and optional protocol, signatures and ratification, and the red, the red uh, part actually is, um, is Australia. So your government actually agreed to ratify the convention and the protocol. So you should be able, and authorities should be able to, um, uh, in, in correlation to the UN treaties, try to make a better living for our target population. Of course, pregnant women uh, who are pregnant uh, have to have to be treated as a unit or diet with the feeders, and it's very important. The ethical principle of respect for person makes uh, the women the autonomous decision maker for her, herself and her feeders. The intervention strategy, the intervention strategies uh, during pregnancy ought to benefit both women and feeders. Very often, uh, I make the experience that it's an over-focus on the feeders, and it's, 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 it's not individualized to meet the women's, the pregnant women's need. This gives you uh, just um, the Article 12 um, on, on, the on the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. State parties shall take all appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women in the field of healthcare in order to ensure, on the basis of equality of men and women, access to healthcare services, including those related to family planning. In continuation, state parties shall ensure to women appropriate services in connection with pregnancy, confinement, and the postnatal period granting free services where necessary, as well as adequate nutrition during pregnancy and lactation. The Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. This is one of my favorite treaties, actually. Article 12 tells you that the state parties to the present covenant recognize the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. And it states very clearly to enjoy the benefit of scientific progress and its application. So this is very clear written. We have to know the evidence, what's the best treatment standard for them. And then we have the basis, actually, uh, and, the authority, and, and, and the organization would need to approach the authorities, and there, if there would, and it's very interesting that I was asking who is actually familiar with MPM. I think it would be very, really, very beneficial if you look it up, who is the organization, who is responsible, how big is the organization, where are they located um, in Australia and in New Zealand. What is also um, stated in the CRPD that in the development and implication of legalization and policies to implement the present convention and its other decision-making processes concerning issues relating to persons with disabilities, state parties shall closely consult with and actively involve persons with disabilities, including children with disabilities, through their representative organizations. So this is a learning effect. What we have been doing over the last, since I'm heading this, uh, this Human Rights Commission, we actively involved women who, were, who, who have been using drugs, who were pregnant, who were treated, who made their own experience to being included in the official visits, whether we evaluate if the population are really receiving best treatment uh, possible, free of care, and it was very important with the, with the exact way of being non-maternalistic, non-paternalistic, and also including their deficiency on cognitive dissociation, like they require more 
more often and more intensive explanation for their decision making. Um, well, uh, this is um, just talking about the right of, of, of liberty and security uh, displayed in the Patient Act. And this is one, uh, what is uh, very important as all the UN treaties need to be considered a, on a holistic way and not only picking the child's right convention, what, is, um, uh, what states in three uh, aspects the right, the legal principle, and the procedural rule, as the right must be determined on a case-to-case -case basis. And, ethic, and, and, and the legal principle says it has to be in line. Why it is very important that it has to be in line, as I pointed out already, in consideration and inclusion of the women's well-being. And attention must be paid to all solutions which are in the child's best interest. I skip a, a, some of the slides, and um, I, I, I give an example now. The, the human rights consideration in, in, in relation to opioid-dependent maintained women and their uh, neonates. So we do know methadone and buprenorphine, both of them have been shown that they are fickers and safe. There is actually, in some countries in Europe, there is made a lot of pressure towards the women to be withdrawn from the opioids during the course of pregnancy. First, we do know out of many publications that this is very difficult in general, but especially in pregnancy, whereas we do know that in the majority of cases, even a dose increase must be reached in the last uh, trimenon. And sometimes institutions uh, uh, follow even an extortive approach that women have to show the motivation to be entitled to care for a child. So it's against all human rights to put any pressure on the pregnant woman towards treatment. And this actually is not referring only to the opioid treatment, for example, in pregnancy, but all to other required medication. And to point it out again, there, are, there is no other medication as well uh, investigated as these two medication. And I just briefly give you, um, just you, some of you might be aware of, of course, it's, it's, it's pretty much proven, and many, many studies have confirmed this from Australia, that we do have benefits if administering buprenorphine during the pregnancy um, in regard to needing less morphine for the treatment of neonatal abstinence syndrome, having a shorter duration of treatment as compared to methadone, and having a shorter hospital stay, which is actually the shorter hospital stay is one of the economic goals for, for institutions. But again, it's, uh, it's important to keep this medication what is, uh, what is um, what a woman is doing well, because then the fetus is going to be doing well. And I don't want to go in detail, because I want to use these slides. These were um, a, a study with different sites, um, one in Europe, which was ours, in the rural US, in the urban US. You see, this, and this is the, all the sites together, you see a rather smooth detox curve from buprenorphine uh, exposed neonates, and you see a much higher, you know, higher dosing and, and longer duration on the methadone um, exposed kids. But what is also important, there are other influencing factors. It's not only the medication administered. We do know that morphine is, is by, by far the best medication for the treatment in this population, but it's also the setting. And the setting uh, requires different medical standards, but also non-pharmacological standards. I'm keeping some slides now. One of the issues, and this was in the last um, uh, symposia, is also the pain treatment. The, the, the people with um, a disability have the right of the highest standard of care. If you look in the studies, like following cesarean delivery, opioid maintenance women received significantly less opioid analgetics. Uh, Non-steroid um, um, analgetic medication was administered more frequently in comparison 
um, um, uh, to the opioid maintenance group after uh, for the after after cesarean. So this is very important. It's this makes the women very difficult for the nurses, for example, if they are not having enough pain treatment afterwards. They might be scared of having uh, having consequences. The same, it's very important during the treatment, the postpartum period, some institutions do not inform the mothers about the medication and the diagnostic procedure uh, concerning their newborn. This is seen very critically as the legal guardian has the right for full information about therapy and examination concerning the child in order to give informed consent. Very often, unfortunately, it's paternalistic behavior and just treatment is done because considering that they might not be able to give a judgment on the medication. This is just for an example. In some of the countries, this is, this is neonatal abstinence syndrome treatment with morphine and this is with phenobarbiturates. In some of the countries, uh, it's still used phenobarbiturates and you see by week one, about 50% if they had administered morphine for the treatment, the children don't need any morphine anymore, whereas double the time it's, it's uh, required with phenobarbiturates. Plus, considering the fact phenobarbiturates have some neurotoxic abilities, so we do not want to have this in our population. Um, there are some other specifics that uh, Depending on the hospital facility, it's not everywhere possible to have the joint admission of the substance-dependent um, mothers or opioid-dependent mothers with their neonates, and they are separated, or have other treatment was makes an, makes an extended treatment duration, and which makes uh, which makes breastfeeding almost impossible because of the women are discharged, it's very difficult for them uh, to, uh, um, uh, to manage this. And as one of the recent publications show, it's showing the influences um, on, on the breastfeeding promotion, and this is actually from, stated from the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, showing and stating very clearly that active opioid maintenance medication is no contraindication for breastfeeding, and in addition, it's uh, softening a neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, they also say that these women need more education in order to be confident, because very often they are highly stigmatized, and they are very vulnerable and feeling bad about the situation of the neonate. They also state very clearly the preference should be given to rooming in for the neonate staying with the mother as all these measurements are positively influencing not only the bonding and the right, the human right of a, a mother, but also are positive for the neonatal abstinence syndrome. This is one of the papers also looking into the non-pharmacological care, what else is, is really supportive for the, um, for the clinic of a neonatal abstinence syndrome. One of the recent publications, and I, um, you see it's not new. It's not new what we are talking. 1875 was the first report on neonatal abstinence syndrome, and we are still using um, monitoring scales, like the Finnegan scale first mentioned 1975. So there is actually quite some research needed um, in order to to, uh, to find the best way of, of treatment for uh, the newborn and the mother. And um, I just show this, I don't know whether Nick Clark is still here because Nick Clark, who is now back in Australia, he was very important at WHO. And under his guidance, there is the guidelines um, um, for the management of substance use disorder in pregnancy developed at WHO, and I think it's available and it's you can you can download it from the web page of WHO. What is the conclusion now on the neonatal abstinence syndrome? One cannot predict at birth whether a newborn will develop neonatal abstinence syndrome and how severe the degree will be. 
There exist too many different variables which could have an influence on these factors. It's important to have a non-authoritarian information to the pregnant women if you are do this. And this is Albert Einstein, not any, everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So it's about only 50% only or maybe, maybe say 60% independent on dosing develop a neonatal absence syndrome. And recent literature actually was really pointing out it's probably not depending on the medication, it's more a, 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 a pharmacogenomic influence who is developing this or not. But from the human rights aspect, it's very important to try to destigmatize. Because if we have a newborn to a mother with depression, which is much more common, we also see a floppy infant syndrome. This is related to our treatment because the alternative is much worse. And so this is, um, and this is the most exciting thing, preparing this lecture here. The best literature for neonatal absence syndrome is actually coming out of, of Australia, which is really great. And you, you, see, you see some of the last papers who are basically just in confirmation what I have been telling you now. Uh, there is one, one other aspect I want to mention for completion, as I don't know how it's in your country, or in your, conti or in your countries, your continents. Uh, in some European countries, institutions demand postpartally a so-called quasi-voluntary rehabilitation admission of women and neonates with substance dependence in order to keep the children. This is, of course, and I just have pointed it out, that uh, based on the, um, on the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, Article 10, there is the right to respect for private and family life, um, the home, for home and correspondence. There is, uh, they have the right to stay with their partners and not being isolated because somebody wants to prove whether they are, um, uh, they are able to, uh, uh, to have the children. And this is one, um, one um, study, a couple of years published. I don't know whether you're aware of this, because I also want to highlight that it's very important also look into the dangers and, and stating if we apply the individual uh, human rights treaties early enough, we can prevent problems. And this is a study from New South Wales. They looked into um, it's a retrospective analysis. We do know the weaknesses of retrospective analysis, but they looked into hospital charts between 2000 and 2011 in children with neonatal abstinence syndrome in some without neonatal abstinence syndrome. And this was a big cohort, more than one million births um, between July 1st, 2000 and December 21, 2011. And they say point, point 38 were diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome. There was 0.1% um, of um, patients with children with neonatal abstinence syndrome and 0.2% with non-neonatal abstinence syndrome died before discharge. The number of episodes of children who needed resubmission was significantly higher in children being born to neonatal abstinence syndrome. And there was a significant high amount of uh, young children died during the observational period. You have this summarized here in these slides showing the curve of the children with neonatal abstinence syndrome without. And these were the reasons for hospitalization of the children with neonatal abstinence syndrome, assault, maltreatment, poisoning, mental behavioral and visual disorders. So this is one of the aspects um, why we are obliged to provide not only the individualized care, we should provide the institutional care. And uh, because this uh, population is on a high risk and they have the right, based on their disabilities, to have the adequate approach towards treatment. And just to sum up this study, this is related to all hospital charts related to neonatal abstinence syndrome. This is not only, this is the weakness of the study, that every, everybody who was coded with this diagnosis was included. So it's not exactly to any of the um, uh, specific substance use disorders. And at the end, of course, I need to cover one aspect which is much more common than the opioid problem, 
is the alcohol problem. There has been in Nature 2012 a report, Regulate Alcohol for Global Health, which really uh, showing that 4% of all mortalities cases worldwide are related to alcohol consumption. This number is higher as costs through HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. So this person, this, uh, it's um, Devi Sitter, she was really pointing very critically to the efficacy of WHO, not taking this major problem into account. Alcohol consumption is the third largest health risk factor. In middle-income countries, you're gonna see on the next slides, um, it's even more. And consumption during pregnancy leads to the worst outcome, as we are aware of, because of the neurotoxic uh, uh, features of, 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 of alcohol. It's not only really causing a neonatal abstinence syndrome, but it's causing, um, unfortunately, dysmorphic figures and, 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 and multiple developmental fig figures in the children. Here you find the, the uh, the graph showing that in the developing countries, it's the, um, it's the third uh, highest health burden. And I think when I come to Australia and I always enjoy being here, it's a wonderful atmosphere, the conferences are wonderful. I always see the integration at the beginning of the conferences, you have personal statements of indigenous population. I think if, uh, if you look into the covenant of economic and cultural rights, we do need to learn that we have to, you have to take into consideration to approach the special risk population that they remain in treatment. And this gives you at the end, gives you the, uh, just the economic figures because for politicians, very often, facts are counting. If you would have adequate address of the alcohol use disorder in the general population, and especially in the disadvantaged um, uh, population, and having it on the, on the communication level that it's, uh, that's the, uh, that they can, they, 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 they achieve by the population, we might be able to influence a lot in the, the, the state the states will save a lot of money if uh, gives you just the costs. I'm sorry. Yeah, gives you the costs, uh, the mean costs per year, and then it adds up depending on it's a uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, ADHD, learning disabilities, and up to epileptic seizures. How high the burden, economic-wise, for countries is um, in in the long term. Uh, uh, costs on children being individually exposed to alcohol. There's, to, for the completion, an Italian studies looking into the amount of uh, alcohol during the different trimesters. And this is, uh, again, uh, highlighting how important it is to have a public health prevention program because the most severe uh, effects are, are coming out of too high binge drinking in the first time and on. So that's about the end of my, my presentation. It's about the end of the time. I hope I was able to give you some information on, uh, on the human rights perspective, on the legal UN treaties, Australia signed the protocol and ratification, so you would have a mandate to, to highlight and the needs they are also in your, in your country. And we always, I think, uh, we always, and I had a lot of good conversation yesterday night, I enjoyed it very much. We are here because we care for this population and we should continue together with the UN treaties and the evidence. And this is the end. We know that there is a special need, not only for a selected target population, like substance use or pregnant people, but there is a strong, uh, yes, we need to have a strong f campaign for the substance use disorder patients in prison. It is, um, it's, it's widely addressed. There is the recent UN General Assembly, there is the new Nelson Mandela rules, it's a publication, it's, you, can, you can retrieve very easily. 
And I just wanted to tell you that Germany, they were actually sentenced by the European Court of Human Rights because they have withdrawn a, maintain, a, a methadone maintained person in jail against his will. And this was published in the, I don't know whether you, the, I say Ikomari Money Journal recently, also under the human rights mandate that it was seen as partly torture in parallel that if you would withdraw anybody from any other medication during prison because especially human rights rule apply there. Thank you very much.